Welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's webinar on benefit plans and state law developments. I'd like to introduce Tim Goodman, a partner in Dorsey's Benefits and Compensation Group. Take it away, Tim. Thank you so much, Sean. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our presentation on benefit plans and state law developments. As Sean kindly mentioned, my name's Tim Goodman, and I'm a partner in Dorsey and Whitney's Benefits and Compensation Group. Uh, with me today is a whole panel of folks. We have with us today Melanie Jordan, who is an attorney in Dorsey's Southern California office, who will be joining us to talk about some California law developments. We also have with us Jenna Steiner and Christian Davis, who are both associates here at Dorsey in our benefits and compensation group. Jenna is joining us from Denver and Christian from Minneapolis. And finally with us today is also Melinda Mayer, who is a partner in benefits and compensation with me. And we're all going to be talking to you today about different state law developments that have been occurring that affect benefit plans and also the benefits and HR areas for employers. So again, thanks for joining us. I'm gonna take us through a few housekeeping details here first. Um, you should have received materials and attendance form from DorseyU at Dorsey.com. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact them via that email address or you could submit a question about the program in general using the chat feature. During the program, we'll be monitoring the chat feature and we're gonna to try to answer questions as we go. So if you do have a question about a topic, you know, it'd be great if we were all in person and being able to do this with just a uh, person raising their hand or something. But if you have a question, just go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll try and answer those as we have time. If we don't have time, we'll work on getting to them at the end of the program. During the middle of the program or a little later in the program, we'll be providing a CLE code for all attendees who'd like to get CLE credit. And also we are going to be applying for HR certification credit for those who would like the HR certification credit. So with that said, I've already briefly given you the names of the folks. Uh, we've got this meet the speaker slide so you can just see everybody's face as we get going here. And a quick overview of our topics. So we're gonna to start today by talking about ERISA preemption and then go into a series of laws in a couple of states and then talk about some laws and developments that are created across multiple states. And finally, some remote work considerations when it comes to employees and just benefit plan issues. And with that, I'm going to get us going here on ERISA preemption. So, um, you know, when I started in benefits now many years ago, one of the interesting things about benefits is generally this is a, many employers look at this as a national issue, right? Health plans are governed by national laws. Retirement plans are governed by national laws. We've got the Internal Revenue Code. We've got ERISA. And ERISA has this wonderful provision about preemption. And so for a long time, states were not deeply involved, I'd say, in regulating benefits a great deal after the passage of ERISA in 1974. But over time, states started getting a little bit more involved whenever there was a chink, say, in ERISA. So for instance, before COBRA was enacted, several states, many states actually, passed laws about continuation coverage requirements with respect to insured health plans. Um, states also had concerns before there was a change to ERISA about uh, divorces and qualified domestic relations orders for retirement plans. So it's come up in the past, but recently it seems like it's come up a fair amount more. And so one thing to think about is when does ERISA preempt or prevent a state from regulating certain benefit plans? And we'll be talking about this as we go through today. So we're starting here with a little bit of background. So on this slide here, slide five, what we're really going to do is just talk briefly in very broad terms about ERISA preemption. So ERISA covered plans, what are they? Generally speaking, most qualified retirement plans like 401k plans, defined benefit plans, um, you know, uh, 403b plans often, uh, money purchase pension plans, those types of plans are generally covered by ERISA. Similarly, most health and welfare benefit plans in general, health plans, dental plans, vision, life insurance, long-term disability, et cetera, are also subject to ERISA. And ERISA, we'll get into the preemption in a second, would generally protect those in some ways from state regulation. Plans not covered by ERISA, and so ERISA preemption wouldn't even apply because they're excluded, are governmental plans, church plans, at least non-electing church plans, and then certain health and welfare plans like dependent care assistance or payroll continuation. So not every benefit plan in the first case is actually even protected by ERISA or ERISA preemption. There's gonna be some that are not. So what is this ERISA preemption here? Um, 
For ERISA plans, there's this provision in ERISA that basically says, and I've got it on the slide here, I'm not going to read through it all, thankfully, because it's pretty dense text, but basically it says in that Section 8 that Title I of ERISA will supersede any and all state laws with respect to the employee benefit plans that are covered by ERISA. But then ERISA has several carve-outs, and so one of the first things that goes on after that in ERISA to say is that this exemption does not apply to state insurance, banking, or security laws. So there's already a carve-out. There's also some carve-outs there with respect to tax or other things. But generally speaking, broad-based laws, like an employment law or something, would still be preempted. And then for purposes of clarification, ERISA goes on to say, if you have a self-insured health plan of some type, that is not deemed to be insurance that a state can regulate. So states can regulate, for instance, with respect to a health plan, if it's an insured health plan, states are able to regulate that. They can say, you must provide these benefits, you must meet these mandates, you must do these things. Whereas if it's self-insured, then a uh, employer doesn't have to necessarily follow all those state requirements because ERISA preemption would apply. So the type of plan you have, whether it's self-insured or insured with respect to say a, uh, a health plan in particular, those are things to understand in terms of when ERISA may preempt a state law with respect to the plan. So the bottom line here is ERISA does not preempt all state laws. Um, there are states and states have become more active in looking at ways to regulate things and more concerned, I think, about where people are going to be, especially later in their lives in terms of will they have sufficient savings? Are they getting sufficient information? Should we be doing things to try and encourage our residents to get coverage under health plans? Things like that. I should note that ERISA preemption is also not 100% crystal clear. Um, the Supreme Court has tackled ERISA, I think, more than any other issue is, since 1974. Uh, ERISA is a perennial issue before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court over the years has tried to go ahead and draw lines about when ERISA preemption would apply and when it does not. But again and again, it comes back to this issue. And on this slide seven, there's a few examples here. So for instance, one of the more recent cases just from last year or two years ago is Rutledge v. Pharmaceutical Care Association or Care Management Association, where the Supreme Court held preemption did not block a state law that regulated the pharmacy benefit managers. It had an impact on health plans and including self-insured health plans, but the Supreme Court said, no, that was not going to be preempted. Four years prior to that, the Supreme Court did state, however, that a different state law that was actually requiring health plans to report claims to the state of Vermont was preempted. And then there's even an earlier case, which many of these cases stem from here, the New York uh, State Conference of Blue Cross Blue Shield versus Travelers case uh, from 1995, which again, or the Supreme Court found no preemption. So even identifying when something is preempted or not can be somewhat complicated. But as we go through the presentation here, you'll hear us talking about ERISA preemption somewhat because in some cases it may mean that some of these state laws do not need to necessarily be complied with. With that in mind, I'm going to be turning things over here now to our first law and to Jenna, who's going to walk us through the Washington Long-Term Care uh, Services and Support Act, or the Washington Cares Fund, as I like to refer to it as. Jenna, can you tell everybody a little bit about this law and where things are at with it? Yes, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so as Tim mentioned, uh, the Washington Care Fund was passed in 2019 uh, with the purpose of imposing a payroll tax to raise revenue to pay for long-term care assistance expenses for residents of the state of Washington. Now, the original effective date for this payroll deduction was at January 1, 2022, but in, on January 27th of this year, uh, the governor passed an amendment to this act, which actually delayed this effective date. Um, so any amounts that were deducted by employees, um, withheld by employees, are going to need to be refunded to those employees. And the new effective date for this payroll tax will be July 1 of 2023. So in addition to delaying the start date of the payroll deduction, um, the amendments kind of corresponding with that delayed the start of benefits. Um, expanded exemptions for individuals who wanted to apply um, for an exemption from this payroll tax. And the amendment also provided partial benefits to workers who are near retirement, because that was a concern with the initial um, act before it was amended. 
So the Washington Care Fund will impose a payroll tax rate of 0.58% of all wages, and there is no cap. Um, the definition of wages is fairly inclusive. It includes commissions, bonuses, severance, and other taxable compensation. And then beginning in 2026, the payroll tax rate will be evaluated and potentially adjusted every other year. So benefits will be available for individuals starting July 1 of 2026, so three years after the deductions begin. And in order to be eligible for benefits, you need to have contributed to the fund for a certain amount of time. So you could contribute for 10 years without an interruption of five or more consecutive years. You could have contributed for three years within the last six years or for workers born before January 1 of 1968. So those who are nearing retirement, you could have contributed for as little as one year and you would receive partial benefits at that point. And in addition to the amount of time contributing to the fund, um, employees must have also worked a minimum of 500 hours during those 10 or three year timeframes. So there was a lot of discussion with the initial act about who could apply for exemption and there were initially very few exemptions. Um, but as amended now, the following categories of employees can apply for voluntary exemption. So they actually have to apply for this. So employees who are employed in Washington, but maintain a permanent residence outside of Washington as their primary location of residence. So these are individuals who are subject to the payroll taxes in Washington, but are considered residents um, of another state. And so they wouldn't really be able to benefit from the fund. Um, veterans of the US military um, who have been rated by the VA as having service connect disability of 70% or higher. In addition, spouses or registered domestic partners of active duty members of the US Armed Forces. And lastly, employees who have non-immigrant visas um, or temporary workers um, are exempt from this. Now, as I mentioned, you need to apply for this exemption and the state will begin accepting applications for exemption um, next January, January 1, 2023. And once that employee receives an exemption, they have to provide written no notification to their current and any future employees. If the employee fails to provide this notice and this payroll tax is withheld, uh, the employee is not eligible for a refund on that amount. So the employee really needs to submit this notification um, in order to not be subject to this deduction. And now I think Tim was going to tell us um, a little bit about ERISA preemption and some of the challenges that um, this act has faced on those grounds. Thank you, Jenna. So as Jenna kindly noted, there have been a few developments here. We're just gonna note a citizen initiated action to try and see about uh, making participation program optional. And also there's some class action litigation that was filed. Um, and this was filed when the effective date was gonna be 1-1-2022, but I haven't seen that it's been withdrawn at this point. Um, one of the uh, allegations in that complaint is that the Washington CARES Fund is preempted by ERISA. Um, at this point, I'm not certain what a court would think of that. We're going to have to see how that progresses. I do know that in the run-up to this um, period of time, because the law wasn't actually delayed until after it was effective, um, many people last year who were residents of Washington, especially if they were higher earners, looked into or purchased their own long-term care insurance, in part because there was no cap on that payroll tax. Um, I, with respect to that, I think that people can consider, I, for now, at least until there's more developments, they probably want to retain that insurance until either it's clear from a court that it is preempted and maybe then it wouldn't be effective, or if there was some other change to the law, but I know that this has left some people who bought this insurance wondering what actions to take next. So in part, we're going to have to wait and see. The only good news here is that there is now a delay for employers in terms of implementing this on their payroll systems for another 18 months, in essence. And we will see what comes up with respect to the uh, preemption. We, we do have one question here. What if someone already received a long-term care exemption? Will that exemption still be applicable when the tax starts on July 1? Because Originally, those exemptions could be submitted, I believe it was as of November 1 of 2021. 
Um, and Jen, I'd welcome your thoughts too, but I don't think we have any guidance on that, but I don't know why they wouldn't be effective if people have already submitted, but um, perhaps the state of Washington will let us know more. Jenna, do you have anything else there? No, I agree with you. I don't think that they've released any guidance on this. You would think it would still be effective, um, but but we don't have any any guidance as of yet. Yeah. Okay, well, that's the first law there, the Washington Long-Term Services and Sports Act. And now we're gonna to switch to California, always a favorite state of employers. And we're fortunate to have Melanie to talk to us a little bit about the California Consumer Privacy Act. Melanie? Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm an associate here in our Costa Mesa office. And uh, Tim is right, California is a favorite. Um, my reasons for it being favorite may be different than yours, but nonetheless, I'm excited to discuss our uh, privacy act that's been on the books here. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a high level view of the California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA. Um, start from this broad level overview of the law. Then I'm going to provide uh, five kind of steps, more like a checklist that employers should be thinking about um, as we near an impending deadline. And then I will uh, get more granular in terms of discussing um, how does ERISA flow with CCPA? So first of all, what is the CCPA? Well, it was enacted um, in June 28, on June 28 and 2018. So it's been around for a while. Its effective date was January 1st, 2020. And you know that's in general, it took place later on certain portions of it, but in general, it was enacted about two or effective two years ago. Um, the purpose of the CCPA is to protect consumers, which would include employees, private information. Uh, the act actually refers to this information as personal information. And so the, the shortest definition of personal information is nearly everything that you can associate with someone. Um, so this would include identifiers such as like your real name, your address, um, your IP address, like your internet protocol address, email address, um, categories or characteristics of protected classification under California, like state or federal law. Um, it would include your commercial information as well, such as your personal property, biometric information. I know a lot of employers are um, thinking about, I should say, or contemplating using an employee's biometric information, such as using their thumbprint to scan in, things of that nature. Well, that's information that would be protected by the CCPA. Geolocation data in terms of if you're tracking a vehicle's whereabouts from your employee, all of that information would fall um, under the CCPA's, uh, I guess, providence here. So the date, um, the effective date that we want to focus on is the one coming at the top of next year, January 1st, 2023. Because as of now, the employee information in this employment context or personnel context is exempted. And we're going to talk about that a little further. But just because it seems like, oh, that's another year, essentially, I have time. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be taking steps now to prepare for that. So I'm going to talk about five steps to help you as you um, prepare for your obligations for the coming year. So the first step is concerning um, your obligation to be familiar with the rights that are afforded to consumers and also employees under the CCPA. And so I list the various rights that exist as of now. It's the right to know what kind of inform personal information is being collected about them how the company uses it and processes the information, the right to access their personal information, the right to request that the employer delete personal information. And we're gonna talk about what some of that information can be deleted or not. Um, we're all, they also have the right to know whether um, and to whom their personal information is sold or disclosed. Sold and um, disclosed are, their, their terms of art, they are defined. Um, it's not what we think about in terms of buying and selling the right to opt out of the sale of their personal information and the right to the same quality of services that are provided to consumers um, who choose to exercise versus not exercise those rights. So that's the first step. The second step is you'll need to determine if the CCPA even applies to you. There's another acronym on the slide in CPRA and that essentially amended the CCPA and that happened in November of 2020. Now the CCPA, um, it applies to for-profit businesses, so not nonprofits, that do business in California. And they need to meet one of the following um, criteria. So 
So having an annual gross revenue of over $25 million. Um, and this is total global revenue. It's regardless of where that revenue is derived from. I know there was some confusion when the CCPA was first enacted because um, I guess businesses wondered, well, is it revenue from just the sales in California or is it sales anywhere? And it's anywhere. Um, they've now since clarified that. Um, another criteria to be aware of would be whether the business buys, sells, receives, or shares this personal information of at least 50,000 California residents or households or devices. And then another criterion would be if you derive at least 50% um, of your annual, annual revenue from selling the California residents personal information. So keep those criteria in mind. I would um, proffer that these criteria apply to most of um, at least Dorsey's clients. So this is something that should be on everyone's radar. As to step three, this one's a little more dense. So we're going to um, spend a little bit more time here. Um, step three involves understanding the extent of what we call the employee exemption for human resources data is what we're going to call this. So HR data is largely exempt from the CCPA for the time being. So what is this employee exemption? Well, it's the personal information of a job applicant, an employee, owner, director, officer, medical staff member, independent contractor of a covered business. That information of those individuals are exempt, but as long as they're using the, the employer, I should say, is using that personal information in the context of the employment or personnel relationship. And it's to maintain emergency contact information or to administer benefits, which is more relevant here. Um, so although this information is exempt, there are still some obligations that exist for the time being. Um, those three obligations include safeguarding the human resources data. Um, that you, employers should keep in mind that um, if there's a breach that employees or personnel can seek um, or file a private action regarding that breach and seek statutory damages. Um, the other obligations include providing a notice to the employees regarding the data and how it's used. And then we also need to be aware um, that we need to do CPRA compliant contracts with vendors who handle the personal information. So we're gonna flesh out um, all three of those obligations. So first, we need to understand um, what is the notice. So you have to provide a notice to the employees regarding the data and how it's collected. So we'll need to look at what goes in the notice and then when do you provide the notice? So in terms of the content of the notice, um, there's not a model notice that's been provided under the CCPA, but all the, the CCPA provides is that it must describe the categories of personal information to be collected and the purpose for which the categories of personal information are used. So now that the CPRA is on the books, we do have a little bit more information about what this notice should include. You need to disclose sensitive personal information that is collected or processed, but only if that information is used for the purposes of inferring characteristics about your workforce. So sensitive personal information, that term may sound very similar for those of you who are familiar with GDPR, the European equivalent of the CCPA, as I like to call it. Um, this is sensitive information that includes someone's social security number, their driver's license number. Um, it would also include information that reveals your racial or ethnic origin, um, your religious or philosophical beliefs, union membership, their precise geolocation, your sex life, sexual orientation, contents of your mail, email, and text messages. This information is sensitive and should be disclosed as a separate category in the notice. However, again, I note that this is only required to be disclosed as a separate category if this information is being used to draw inferences. So in other words, if it's not being used to draw inferences, then um, it can be lumped into the other categories or broader categories of personal information. And this is helpful from an employee's relations standpoint because it draws less questions. Um, it looks you know, a little less off-putting for those who may be very sensitive about their personal information. The notice should also discuss your retention schedule. Um, a lot of you may already be familiar with retention schedules. Um, this is essentially uh, tells you how long you should keep your documents. Um, some of this is prescribed by law in terms of like a personnel file. 
tax information. So this concept isn't new, but disclosing the retention schedule that will meet, need to be touched on in the notice given to the employees. So this brings me to the final point about the notice, which is when do we give this kind of notice? So this must be given to the employees at or before the point of collection. Um, I typically like to um, recommend to employers that this kind of notice just be given during onboarding. Just give it at that point along with all the other paperwork um, and that way it's already taken care of. Um, you also should provide a copy of or a link to the employment privacy policy. And a lot of times people get confused because they think, well, we have our general privacy policy that's on our website, um, so we'll just provide that. Well, very rarely does a website privacy policy address human resources or internal data that the company's dealing with. So we often craft one that's just for employment purposes, and we link that or provide that along with the notice to the employees. So the next obligation that we should be aware of that exists right now for the human resources data would be um, looking at your vendor contracts. So the CCPA in the past has required contracts to establish service provider relationships. And now with the amendment, the CCRA, it expands that requirement to include transfers to third parties and contractors, which is a new category of entities. So at this point, it gets a little dense in the presentation, so I'm just gonna keep it high level. But for those of you who have you know, taken a look at this, you'll be familiar with some of these terms, like there's businesses, there's service providers, there's third parties, and now there's contractors. So if you have, um, I guess, contracts or agreements with third party vendors, whether it's like a payroll provider, a benefits administrator, you'll need to look at those contracts and make sure that they contain what is required by the CPRA. So just from a high level, those contract provisions um, should specify that the personal information is sold or disclosed, that is sold or disclosed, excuse me, by the business is only for those limited and specified purposes. Um, and it'll outline all the obligations that are required and ask that the third party not go outside of those lines. So step four involves understanding the new obligations that have occurred. So at the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that we have a deadline of January 1st, 2023. So while it seems that's in the future, um, it's actually quite present. Um, as background, HR data for personnel, employee, employment, employer relationship data, that was exempt until January 1st, 2021. Then that was pushed back until January 1st, 2022 of this year. And now it's been pushed back to January 1st, 2023, but the, CCPR, the CPRA has a 12 month look back provision, meaning that if I, as an employee, decide to exercise my rights come January 1st, then I want to be able, uh, or the employer should be able to pull information from the last 12 months. So going back to January 1, 2022, which means as of now, you need to make sure that you have um, information in place so that you're able to respond to that um, request. Um, there's also more rights that are afforded under the CPRA. So in addition to the six rights I mentioned earlier, now we have three more rights, and that's seven through nine on this slide. Um, it's the right to correct your personal information. It can limit the use and disclosure of the sensitive personal information I mentioned earlier, and they can opt out of the sharing of their personal information as well. And I would like to flag as well that there is an awareness of enforcement that uh, employers should possess. Um, there are additional rights here, as I mentioned, that they can seek a private right of action for, just like the other six rights. And then the CPRA has now created the California Protection or Privacy Protection Agency, which administratively enforces the CCPA. We've been tracking um, the enforcement of, um, of what they've been doing because they started this past July. It's kind of slowly ramping up, but that is something we're keeping an eye on. Now, the last step here that employers should be aware of is um, they need to create a plan to comply with the CCPA and the CPRA. So although that deadline seems very far away, we should be taking some comprehensive steps now, which includes data mapping, pretty much figuring out where's all your data at and where can we easily access this so that we can respond in a timely fashion. You need to continue providing those, uh, the privacy notices that I mentioned to your employees and personnel. You need to ensure that your privacy policies are accurate. 
And then you'll need to make sure that you're taking all steps that are necessary to safeguard the employee data to prevent a breach, which would be your physical, technical, and administrative safeguards. Um, this also includes evaluating your contracts with your vendors, like the payroll providers and the benefits administrators. And then you need to implement a plan to ensure the tracking of the data from January 1 of 2022 this year and onward. So at this point, I think that um, Tim will discuss some recent developments concerning ERISA. Sure, Melanie, first we have a question here, so I'll just read it to you. Um, if we're an employer located in Minnesota and we do not have any employees located in California or have any locations in California, do we need to comply with the CCPA? Right, so with respect to your employee information in California, if you don't have employees in California, then you don't need to worry about this. What if you are, if you have consumers or if you're doing business in California and you have a reach to California, you'll need to be concerned about the CCPA from a consumer standpoint. And I'm happy to discuss all those obligations offline, but they're essentially the same um, as to what I mentioned before, except you're not providing the, the notice, but you do need to make sure that your privacy policy and uh, is in place. And you do need to make sure that you have your data all mapped out so that you can respond um, to the consumers who choose to exercise the nine rights that exist as of now. Perfect. So I'm gonna take us to the uh, consumer, the final slide here about the California Consumer Privacy Act and um, basically talk a smidge about ERISA preemption. Um, so far, we have not seen cases filed about whether ERISA preemption may or may not apply with respect to the CCPA, with respect to employees and reporting of employee information or providing the notice. Um, and I think it'll be interesting at this point, the new agency really hasn't issued guidance on the extent to any rights that uh, Melanie kindly outlined and how they would apply if there's anything that's required beyond a notice to employees about what you're doing. I could see if all that's required of employers is to provide the notice to employees that, hey, we provide your uh, birth date, your age, your other information to our vendors, such as our retirement plan vendor and our health plan vendor and so forth. I don't know that um, a court would necessarily see ERISA preemptions applying in that case. However, to the extent that then employees can exercise rights with respect to the plans, then I could more likely see a court thinking that that might indeed be overstepping the bounds with respect to ERISA protected plans. And there's a few questions that have come in. And so uh, we'll take these and Melanie, I'll ask, uh, the first one I think is a little bit more for me. The question is, how will this all interact with HIPAA? And uh, it's a very good question, and I wish I could say I know, but I, at this point, do not know. I think that in general, obviously, um, states can impose additional requirements beyond HIPAA. And so it'll be interesting to see, especially with an insured plan, or to the extent you have an insured health plan in California, I don't think that ERISA preemption would prevent the CCPA from being effective. If you have a self-insured plan though, um, you, there might be an argument that a ERISA preemption would prevent that law from applying. So we'll have to see about that. Um, the well, next Tim, question may I, here. Tim, may I chime please. in on that question? Sure, please. Yes. Yes, so the CCPA does include an exemption for protected health information that's collected by a covered entity subject to the HIPAA privacy rules. But because right, employer sponsored health plans um, are HIPAA covered entities, then any personal health information held by the self-insured plan um, are HIPAA protected and they're outside of the reach of the CCPA. But, and this exemption also applies to the personal health information held by your business associates, such as the third party administrators. But other health related information that's held by the employer outside of the health plan, um, such as information related to your disability benefits, sick leave, leave of absences, that information's not covered by the exemption and would fall under the CCPA. Yep. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, a few other questions here, and then we may need to go on to our next topic quickly, but um, we have one question here. Uh, as a federal contractor, we are required to keep applicant and employee data for two years as part of our mm -hmm. record keeping requirements. Can you speak to the exemptions to keeping data in order to comply with OFCCP requirements and how the state law would interact with that federal law? Absolutely. So the CCPA includes this broad catch-all provision is what I like to refer to as it does not interfere with or imp um, I guess obligations that are imposed under state, federal, or local law, which that, that information would fall under there. So if you have an obligation to keep this data under a separate law, then CCPA would not trump that. 
And we've actually encountered this numerous times with employee, employers. And so what we advise is to state, I know you want to exercise your rights, but for, you know, for this federal law or for this law or legal reasons, we're not able to obligate or to comply with that request. Um, and if there's you know, pushback, then we're happy to take it from there. But generally, if you have other obligations under another law, CCPA does not generally trump that. Okay, one more question here. I think um, our, our entity has California employees in a revenue of $10 million. Our parent company owns 100% of us as total revenue that exceeds 25 million. Do the California laws then apply to the entity with just the 10 million in revenue, given that we're owned by this parent company that has revenue in excess of 25 million? <laughs> so this is a favorite um, scenario of mine. It's not exactly clear, and there's arguments, of course, from at least the plaintiffs bar that, you know, of course, it applies to you too. So um, the short answer is it's not clear. Sometimes we try to argue that the entities are completely separate, um, but there are arguments the other way as well. But keep in mind the CCPA hasn't been alive that long, so there's not been a ton of litigation on this matter. Um, so I will say, I will just shortly say that it's not clear either way. You can make arguments either way, but I'm hoping that with the regulations that are coming, they're supposed they must be issued by July 1st of this year. It'll flesh out a little bit more, and hopefully they'll touch upon that as well. All right. Well, thank you, Melanie. I think we're going to move on to our next law here, the Illinois Consumer Coverage Disclosure Act. Uh, just to keep ourselves on time. And Christian, would you like to talk to us a little bit about this law and how it impacts employers? Yeah, absolutely, Tim, and thank you. And since we're a little bit of a ways from the top, I'm going to reintroduce myself. I'm Christian Davis. I'm in Dorsey's Minneapolis Benefits and Compensation Practice. And because I'm in Minneapolis, I'm going to pull the attention away from the Pacific Coast as the last two topics and bring us back into the Midwest. And so last summer, the state of Illinois passed the Consumer Coverage Disclosure Act. And the purpose of this act is to provide employees in the state of Illinois some transparency into the health care coverage that their employers offer and how it compares to the state of Illinois' benchmark, benchmark plans. Um, notably, this applies to employers that are outside of the state of Illinois as long as there are employees within the state. Um, and so what the law requires is fairly simple. Um, they, the, the state of Illinois has, uh, has supplied a sample benchmark plan and even an Excel sheet in which uh, employers can side by side compare what their health insurance offers to uh, the state of Illinois benchmark plan. Um, and they are required to supply it to employees at three different uh, points. First, at the initial hire, uh, annually thereafter, and if applicable, upon the request of the employee. Um, it is important to note that an employee means any individual permitted to work by the employer. And so non-employees could, for purposes of the CCDA or the, the Consumer Coverage Disclosure Act, I don't want it to get confused with CCPA because it sounds so similar, um, employee could mean non-employees. Um, the law requires the notice to be provided by email or on the employer's intranet. Uh, that the employee has regular access to. And interestingly enough, the Consumer Coverage Disclosure Act has fairly light penalties. Uh, first, if the Illinois Department of Labor finds that the employer has violated the law, the employer has 30 days to comply. Um, and for employers with more than four employees, the penalties, like I said, are fairly light. It's a thousand dollars for the first offense, three thousand for the second offense, five thousand for the third, fourth, fifth, and every subsequent offense. Uh, it's important to note that an offense is all of the non notifications or inadequate notifications in a single calendar year. So if you have 10 employees and you haven't been giving out the CCDA uh, benchmark notice for a given year, it isn't going to be $10,000 or, or whatever the aggregate uh, penalty would be. It would just be $1,000 for the first offense. 
Um, and that will probably come into play as Tim and I discuss the, the ERISA landscape uh, here in a second. And so this slide, I apologize, this is mice print, um, but I wanted to make sure that it got on the slide for all of you who downloaded it and you could zoom in. This is chopped up um, the Excel sheet that the state of Illinois has provided as a sample disclosure for Illinois employees. Um, important to note that it is not required to be in this form. Uh, this is for the convenience of the employer if, if the employer would like to use it. Uh, but these are the benchmark comparisons that the state of Illinois believes should be provided to the employees under the CCDA. And so, and, uh, or go ahead, Christian. Please. No, please go ahead, Tim. Yeah, and so just real quickly here to make sure we stay on track, I apologize. Um, you know, we have some websites here which give you some of this information. Um, in terms of recent developments, there really haven't been any preemption challenges so far since the law was enacted. Is this preempted by ERISA? Um, I, I personally think that given the case law that it might not be preempted. This is just a notice requirement generally, but we would have to see if there is a challenge. And given how low the penalties are, um, I don't need in how costly it is to bring challenges to laws. I'm not sure that we will see case challenges here. We do have a few questions. We'll take those and then get on to our uh, other topics here real quickly. Um, so one of the questions here is we're headquartered in Washington state, but have one virtual employee who works out of Chicago. Would this apply to us? And Christian, I believe that even if you have only just one employee, there's, there's different rules if you have four or more, but even if you have one, technically you're supposed to be providing this notice, correct? That's right. The law would apply. The $1,000, $3,000, or $5,000 penalty would be decreased. Um, but yes, the law would apply, and it would not require the employer to provide notice to the other employees, just to the one Chicago individual. So we have several questions about would the uh, summary of benefits coverage, the SBC, meet this requirement? And another question, if we provide the SBC and SPD, uh, but it doesn't reflect the Illinois points of reference, do we need to add another document that speaks to this? I, I think the short answer there is yes, that it, Illinois is looking for a specific notice and it only has to be provided to employees working out of Illinois, but they are looking for this specific chart of a comparison side by side. And I don't think the SBC or an SPD are going to be sufficient to compare it to the Illinois requirements. And so unfortunately, I think this adds yet another document. Um, so a couple more questions here, maybe we'll see if we can get to them quickly and then go on to our next topic to stay on time. Uh, one question is, are there penalties if the covered services are reported incorrectly? Um, saying we cover something when we don't. And Christian, I don't believe I saw any guidance on that yet. I mean, if it was an innocent mistake, I think that I don't know that you'd be penalized, to be honest. That's right. And because of how new the law is, we don't have any sort of case law or any precedent to go off of. Uh, I think that this would fall into the 30-day correction after the Department of Labor uh, figures out that you're, I, I would say, not in compliance. Um, and so there would be a correction period available if you were misreporting. Uh, I do think it's important to note that this does not require any of the employers to meet the benchmark uh, guidelines or the benchmark uh, coverage. It just requires them to provide comparisons. What we're going to do now here is go ahead and to um, talk about two topics that extend over a number of states. The first of these is state reporting of health coverage. And I'm going to turn this over to Jenna and Melinda to talk to us about this. Thank you, Tim. So as we know, the Affordable Care Act, as originally passed, had an individual mandate requiring individuals to maintain health coverage or face a penalty. And in connection with this mandate, certain reporting, certain disclosures were required um, specifically from applicable large employers, employers with 50 or more employees. So they were required to send out either the form 1095 C or B um, or 1090 and the 1094 C or B. So these forms went to the employees um, indicating whether or not 
they were offered minimal essential coverage and whether or not they were enrolled in minimum essential coverage. And then these forms also went to the IRS and had essentially a, a cover sheet um, that reported a lot of this information. So in 2019, though, the individual mandate was repealed. And so some have been questioning sort of the necessity of, of this type of reporting at the federal level. But the states have kind of taken over on their own, imposing their own individual mandates, um, as well as requiring certain disclosures on health coverage. So uh, Massachusetts was actually one of the first states to impose an individual uh, mandate requiring residents to maintain health coverage. And they also require reporting on health coverage for residents. So unlike many of the other states, which accept the federal forms um, at the state level, Massachusetts has its own specific form, the form MA-1099-HC um, that reports this information. Employers are responsible um, for reporting for self-insured plans and employers and insurers would be responsible for reporting on insured plans and failure to do so comes with a penalty of $50 per individual. Um, so as I mentioned, Massachusetts was one of the first states to do this. And then we had a couple more that instituted a mandate effective in 2019, which would then require reporting in 2020. So these states include New Jersey as well as DC. Um, these states uh, accept the federal form, the 1094C or the 1095C. And it's very um, similar employers report for self-insured plans. Employers and insurers are responsible for reporting on insured plans. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Melinda to talk about some of the more recent states um, as well as some considerations of this type of state requirement. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, so we have, as, as Jenna mentioned, now we have three more states kind of jumping into this fray or getting on the bandwagon and requiring reporting um, using the federal reporting uh, that is already in place, luckily. Um, but I think it's just uh, il illustrative of the trend that we're seeing here in states wanting basically to make sure their population um, is getting coverage, um, you know, for various reasons. So we've got California, Rhode Island, and Vermont um, getting into the into the fray, and we've provided links that give you more information on that reporting. Um, and then if we move to the next slide, I mean, I think what you need to consider here is, first of all, it's just uh, administratively difficult, right? The, the reporting is going to increase your administration. Um, you have you have to make sure you're sending the right forms for the right individuals. A lot of this, I assume, you are outsourcing if you are a large self-funded plan. So you will have to interact with your vendors to see if they can do this for you. Um, but I think you know, and I think Tim's going to jump in and talk a little bit more here about ERISA preemption. But I, but I think it's worth thinking about. You know, I'm old enough to remember when we, you know, we wanted to protect our ERISA preemption very much because if you're a large employer with plans that span, you know, these many states, these 50 states, it is very hard to comply with each state law here. And I think little by little, what we're seeing is kind of an eating away at this notion that you can rely on ERISA preemption and have more of a uniform administration across 50 states. Um, I think the reporting in particular is probably going to be a hard one to win an ERISA preemption argument on, but I don't know, Tim, if you've got some thoughts on that. Um, th thank you, Melinda. I guess I, I would agree with you. I think that a state would argue, look, this is just for the collection of taxes, right? We are just like we require employers to report information to us with uh, W-2 in terms of wages, we get that information from the federal government. We're just asking employers to provide the 1095Cs that they've already prepared. And so I think it'd be hard for an ERISA preemption argument with respect to these reporting requirements, even though it adds an extra burden to employers. Um, but that's just my take. And I, I'm not aware of any challenges so far to these reporting requirements, I should say. We've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to take us quickly through here. Um, Christian's going to help me with the state plan or state retirement plan mandate section here. 
And what I'll do, Christian, is I'll take this first slide, and maybe you have like four or five minutes to do the others. And just real briefly, like other things, states are noticing that, hey, we've got a lot of people who are workers who don't have access to retirement plans and maybe aren't saving enough for retirement. And we're worried that when they retire, they won't have enough and they won't be able to pay for their health care or for uh, you know, long-term care or other things. And so a number of states, you'll see on the next slide, have actually worked to start implementing their own um, programs where if the employer does not provide a retirement plan, then the employer is supposed to help its employees enroll in and contribute to theirs. Three states are the furthest along. They're mentioned at the bottom, California, Illinois, and Oregon. And as of the end of last year, their plans have cumulatively more than $400 million in assets that people have had deducted from their pay, and there's more than 240,000 accounts for just those three states at this point. Um, real briefly, um, here's the list of states. Christian and I are not going to run through this list, but you can see it's fairly extensive. And it's not just states. We also have cities that are jumping into this to just make life more complicated. Uh, New York City and Seattle have both enacted things I think depending on if the states, I know with New York it the city, it basically says if the state starts, then we're going to discontinue our program. But, um, you know, these programs are something where if you aren't offering a coverage to your employees, you may want to take a look and see what is required. Christian, I'm going to take us to the next slide. Do you want to just give Illinois as an example of what's going on in one state? We, we don't have time for all the states, so we put one in here. Can you talk to us about Illinois just a little bit? Absolutely. So in the state of Illinois, a employer with more than five employees um, that has been operating for at least two years is required to participate in the Illinois Secure Choice Program or offer another qualified retirement plan. Um, covered employers are required to automatically enroll employees and withhold 5% of, of employee pay unless there is an opt out. Um, and so at least in the state of Illinois, they are setting employees who otherwise would not have access to a private 401k or other retirement savings plan up for um, automatically registering and saving for retirement. Um, in, there is a staggered start to this with larger employees already uh, being required to be implementing the law. Um, smaller employers, five to five, there are five to 15, as you can see, are not required until uh, the latter part of 2023. And, you know, there's some resources here on this slide, too, for those who have employees in Illinois. We do have one question. Do interns count as employees for these 401k or for these state retirement plan mandates? And all I can say is that you'd probably have to look on a state by state basis. Um, I think in, if an intern's a quote-unquote employee, a common law employee, I think that would count, normally speaking. I should note that most states are not up and running. They've enacted things, but due to the pandemic and other things, many states have put things off. But these three states, California, Oregon, and Illinois, are up and running. And I should note that there's also not tons of guidance about these plans out of, in terms of well, let's say you're an employer and you offer a plan, but you don't offer it to one group of your employees or things like that. There's some things like that that I think will be clarified in the future. Um, uh, real briefly here, a little bit more background about this, and then we'll switch to some other, one final topic. So um, the prior administration, the Obama administration, and, and the DOL had actually issued a final rule that basically encouraged states to do this. The rule had been adopted in the last year of President Obama's second term. Uh, back in 2016. One of the first things Congress did when the Trump administration came in is actually Congress voted to repeal a rule. This is extremely rare, but it did so in 2017. Um, but the mere repeal of the rule does not exactly mean that then this does violate ERISA by having the states go forward. It just meant that there was less certainty about whether or not this was something that was permitted under ERISA. There has been litigation, and the litigation has been focused in California. I've got the case name here, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association versus the California Secure Choice Return and Savings Program. Nice mouthful there. In that case, the Ninth Circuit has held preemption did not block the program, but that has now been appealed to the uh, Supreme Court. There's a petition for cert pending before the court to, court to consider. Illinois and Oregon have both filed amicus briefs with the, California, the court about this program, and of course are arguing that ERISA preemption does not apply. 
I think we'll have to see what the Supreme Court does and what happens here to see if ERISA preemption might apply. We do have one more question. I'll read it here quickly. Do these states require employers to register and provide information as to whether they offer a retirement plan to employees? If yes, do you have a list of which ones? Um, I, again, I am going to apologize here. The requirements, of course, vary by state. And so I think employers are required to say, at least Illinois, if they have a retirement plan program or go through and get enrolled into the program, uh, basically, you'd have to go through and look at each of the states to double check the other states. And in many of the states, the programs aren't currently effective. Again, they're working on putting them up and getting them working. So this is just, again, an example of how states are becoming much more active in the area of benefits and something then that obviously HR and benefit professionals have to be aware of. Real quickly, we have one last topic that we're going to talk about here and that's remote work and benefit issues. And so one of the things touched on earlier was we've got this one remote worker in Illinois, do we have to provide them with this notice? And I think the short answer there is yes, technically you'd be required to provide them with this notice. And I think the pandemic has really brought to light issues involving remote workers and benefits and complying with state laws. I know we've worked with, I think all of us on this panel have worked with employers who were hiring people or maybe had people who went remote during the pandemic. And then all of a sudden they might be surprised a little bit by, boy, we've got people in eight states and are we really complying with say workers' comp laws there or unemployment insurance laws to the extent we're required to wage and withholding and reporting and things. So those are things to consider, but they're not just there. And there's these things which also affect uh, HR and benefit professionals. So for example, you know, if you have employees who are remote workers who are telecommute, a number of states have laws requiring you to reimburse them for their equipment and expenses that they might use in performing their work. We have examples here for California and also for Illinois again. There's other states though that are listed there. And basically you have to drill down a little bit. There's not always good guidance or regulations on, well, do you have to cover an internet connection or would a cell phone necessarily be covered or other things like that. Again, because this is a state by state situation, you practically need to check the state by state to see what might need to be covered in that kind of situation. And then finally here, one other thing that has been coming up, and I know especially with the first one uh, here in California, state and local COVID paid leave laws. Uh, two states in particular, California and Colorado, have special laws relating to leave with respect to COVID. Um, they also have other paid leave laws too, but California just recently um, renewed a 2021 law and extended into 2022 through um, September. This is a very, very, very high level overview. If you have questions, uh, Melanie's contact information is twice in the presentation. I'll say, please drop her email or give her a call and she can help you with that for sure. Uh, Colorado also has a public health emergency paid leave law that is in effect. And these, these both require notice being given to employees. They require different counting of hours to track and see that people are getting this time off. And so one of the things, again, if you have remote workers, and I think you have to think about how is this going to work with all of our paid leave laws? I mean, that gets both into our area of benefits and also into employment law. And so you want to go ahead and think through that and make sure you're in compliance. We are just about at time here. We've got about one minute left. Uh, as, as the end here, we have all of our smiling faces again, and I'll put that up for a second. Um, we have one question, and I'll try and take that, and then we can see if there's any other questions that come in. So a question here is, with the federal health mandate, which requires participation levels, is a full cafeteria plan still an option, or is that a thing of the past? Does Dorsey help with establishing such a plan or a vendor? I'm not sure I fully understand that question, and uh, the person who wrote it can contact uh, Melinda or me later. Maybe we could follow up on that a little bit. Um, I, I will say this. One, well, I think this question might be getting to is there are all sorts of requirements under federal law where basically you have non-discrimination tests that applies to your health plan, and another applies to your cafeteria plan, and another applies to the health flexible spending account, and another applies to dependent care. In one way, it'd be wonderful if federal law just said, look, if you spend the same amount of compensation or the same dollar amount on all your employees, we don't care where it goes. If it goes to health, if it goes to life, if it goes to retirement, if you gave every employee, say, I'm just making up a number here, 10% of their pay to put towards whatever benefits they want, that would make life easy. But the difficult thing here is that, of course, that's not how it works. There's all these rules, including with the Affordable Care Act, the failure to offer affordable coverage could result in penalties. Um, 
Next question here real quickly, and then we will just give everybody a chance to wrap up briefly. Where is the best place to check state laws defining telecommuter expense coverage? Um, I don't know that there is any one good resource. Um, you could contact us and we could try and at least provide you with some um, and go from there, but I don't think there's a great resource on that, to be honest. So I'm just going to ask my fellow panelists if they have any other brief comment, and then maybe we will uh, thank everyone and go from there. Uh, everyone, any final comments here? Okay, seeing, seeing none, I think we're now at time. I want to thank all of you for coming to the presentation today. We hope that the materials are useful. Again, um, the materials were sent, and um, if you need anything, you can feel to contact, free to contact Dorsey, you, or any of us, and we can go from there. So thank you again for your time and participating in today's program.